Bob is somebody who I always associate with drug delivery uh, very much. This person has done so much for the field, not only in terms of, of advances in drug delivery, but in terms of making ideas come to fruition into being commercialized. Because unless you commercialize some of these things, you really don't have a societal impact. And Bob's done that as well as his efforts of training students. He's been a wonderful mentor. And so many things, I think Dave Terrell said, said, said it all already this morning about what Bob has done so much. And we look forward very much to hearing from you, Bob. It's yours. Well, Richard, thank you so much. Um, it's really an uh, honor to, to be doing this, especially with the amazing group of people that you've already heard from and that uh, we're also session chairs, including yourself. I want to thank the, the foundation and, and actually since a number of the speakers mentioned conflicts or, or, or places they, uh, I, you know, I, I should do the same. So I, uh, for me, it's Moderna, El Nylum, Alchemies and Tara Biosystems of the ones that I'll be speaking about. But I thought I'd start and tell you uh, how I got involved in drug delivery, even leading up to some of the things with uh, you know, the RNA vaccines. But, and it didn't come from a, you know, a, a really a very well thought out or, or, or planned uh, situation. You know, when I, when I finished my graduate work in 1974 in chemical engineering, almost all my friends went into the oil industry and I wasn't that excited about it. And I couldn't get a job doing, I got lots of jobs in the oil industry, but I couldn't get a job doing hardly any of the things that I was interested in, which were in, either in education or medicine. And then one day I remember walking into the lab and I, uh, you know, st by that time I was working on medical jobs that nobody would hire me for. And, and I was walking into the lab and one of the postdocs said, Bob, he said, you should uh, write to this surgeon named Judah Folkman. He said, sometimes he hires unusual people. He thought very highly of Dr. Folkman. I won't say what he thought about me, but at any rate, I wrote to Dr. Folkman and he offered me a job. And if we could go to the first slide, Okay, so why don't we go to the next slide? Yeah, so this was an idea that Dr. Folkman had about how cancer develops with respect to its blood vessels. And the idea is that the tumors start out like as a single cell or a few cells that are abnormal. This was actually from the 1971 in the New York Times actually. And anyhow, but it grows if you go to the bottom, if you look at the bottom left, it's sort of a pattern that, it grows to about um, a millimeter cubed. And it can't really grow beyond that uh, because of a nutrition problem. Cells in the center die because they can't get nutrients or get rid of waste. But the way Dr. Folkman thought tumors solved that problem is it sent out a chemical signal, which you see on the bottom left called tumor angiogenesis factor. Um, and, and that causes the surrounding blood vessels, which are normally quiescent, to start growing right to the tumor. And that solves the nutrition problem. And the, as you see on the upper right, the tumor gets, is now vascularized, gets bigger and bigger. And if you go to the top part, it actually is very vascularized. It spreads through those blood vessels. That's a process called metastasis. And that's certainly one of the things that helps that causes death. So when I came, my job was to, it, it turned out to be a very controversial theory. So when I came, my job was to prove he was right and to also, in so doing, isolate the first substances that could stop blood vessels from growing. So again, I'm a chemical engineer, so how do you solve a problem like that? Well, the first thing is, where could you ever find anything that stops blood vessels? And one of the things we thought about was cartilage. And we got a little bit of a cartilage from little rabbits in the lab, but you couldn't get that much. So chemical engineer, I thought, well, you should scale up. So I went to cows and I found a slaughterhouse and I got a cow bone, but still you couldn't get that much. Uh, and so I found out where uh, do all of the bones in Northeastern United States go? And it turns out they go to these meat packing places in South Boston. So I made an arrangement with them to get all, all their bones. I'd go there four or five times a week. I'd drive them back in my car and I, next slide. And then I'd uh, scrape meat off of it. And if you look at this picture, this is a picture of one of those bones and the top part's cartilage. So I'd slice it off, I'd, I'd extract it in guanidinium hydrochloride, and then I'd put it through various columns like uh, ion exchange or, or molecular sieve columns. And then that, that gets into the second problem. How would you ever test something that stops blood vessels? 
And one of the things that's been key, really, when you look back at medical, the medical field is for things like this, you need a bioassay. And there was no way, no bioassay to study blood vessel growth. So we had to invent one. And so what we thought about, next slide, is that maybe what you could do is put certain tumors in. Uh, this is from a paper in Science of 1976, uh, like a V2 carcinoma that will cause blood vessels to grow. But then you need a little pellet um, that would, could be next to it that could deliver macromolecules, uh, substances that were in cartilage. Uh, and, and so, uh, but when Dr. Folkman was on the board of the one company in the world that was actually doing any work on this at the time, it's a company called Alza. And he went there to talk to them and they all told him, well, you can't, you can deliver small molecules or lipophilic ones, but not large molecules. Uh, the next slide just shows a statement to that effect. Uh, and, and, and basically people didn't think they could diffuse through solid materials, just like none of us could walk through a brick wall. And the next slide just shows the literature said similar things. For, for me, I didn't read the literature, so I kept trying anyhow. I actually still found over 200 ways to, uh, sh to get this to not work. But eventually I was able to like make little microparticles or nanoparticles. The next slide shows an example of that. Uh, there's one and another cut in half. And we published in Nature in 1976, next slide, that you could use this approach to really release molecules of any size. This, these are proteins, but we also did peptides, nucleic acids, polysaccharides, and so forth. Uh, and, 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 and so this showed actually that you could use little micro or nanoparticles to deliver things like uh, RNA or DNA or peptides or things like that. Uh, the, the release rates weren't constant at all at that, uh, at that time, but we worked out ways uh, uh, using some chemical engineering approaches uh, to get the right kinds of materials and geometries. And, and the next slide, just a demonstration from a paper we wrote that you could get constant release. Nonetheless, when I first presented this, I remember it was in 1976 at a material science meeting. I, I practiced this talk for, for weeks and I was very nervous. I was always a, not a very good speaker. And I practiced this talk for weeks uh, and I got up and I gave this 20 minute talk and I felt actually I did much better because I didn't forget too much what I was gonna say or stammer too much. So I thought when I was done with this talk that all these older chemists and en engineers being nice people would wanna encourage me this young guy. But when I stepped off the podium, a whole bunch of them came up to me and they said, we don't believe anything you just said. Uh, the next slide, just uh, articulates that. Uh, the first point I made earlier that people said that they couldn't get through solid materials. And the next slide, uh, and the next point was that they would, uh, what we can go back, that they would denature, the solvents we we're using would denature whatever we put in, peptides, proteins, nucleic acids. Uh, and, and things actually went downhill from there. I remember trying to get research grants to support the cancer research that I was doing and the drug delivery research. And the first nine I got rejected very soundly. Uh, I remember one of them came back saying, well, Dr. Langer's a chemical engineer. He knows nothing about uh, biology and even less about oncology. Now, I thought at least I knew enough ma about math to know that wasn't possible, but I wasn't calling the shot. So I wasn't doing very well. And then I, I you know, I like being a postdoc, but a lot of my friends told me it wasn't a good idea to be a postdoc forever. So I started applying to chemical engineering faculty positions, but no chemical engineering department would hire me. They all thought this bio stuff that I was doing didn't make a lot of sense. And then um, I finally got a job in the nutrition department. I think I got that because Dr. Folkman was friendly with the head of the department, Nevin Scrimshaw. But Nevin Scrimshaw, he was a famous nutritionist, but he was kind of like what I'll call a benevolent dictator kind of department head. And so he liked me, so he offered me a job but he didn't bother to ask the rest of the department what they thought. That still probably would have been okay, except for one thing, which is the year after I joined the department, he left. So a lot, so a lot of the senior faculty told me I should leave too. In fact, the next slide, just Mike Marletta, who was a colleague of mine uh, now at Berkeley, uh, was giving a speech once and he was saying, uh, this is just a direct quote from it, that one evening he went to a faculty dinner to Chinese restaurant with me and some senior MIT professors. This was about 1979. Uh, and he said, a senior scientist sat quizzing us while smoking a cigar. 
He said, when the older scientists heard my concepts for drug delivery, he blew a cloud of smoke in my face and said, you better start looking for another job. So I guess the point is I got a very inauspicious start, but you know, I was kind of stubborn, so I kept trying. And the next slide is the assay that I mentioned to you that we wanted to use. And now we did have these systems that we could use to deliver, as you could see, the different molecules. So before I show the next slide, I wanna give a warning, which is that it's kind of a very bloody slide. We actually did something like 1,000 to 2,000 rabbit eyes, uh, you know, where we implanted tumors and other things in the eye. And I'm gonna just show you, we probably had a, 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 a maybe 50 to 100 things, we probably had uh, almost every one we tried didn't work. Uh, and let me just show you a typical control, but it's very bloody. So if you don't like the sight of blood, you shouldn't look. But this is, next slide is nine weeks. This is on the left without the cartilage derived inhibitor. It's from a paper we published in Science in 1976. But what you see is nine weeks after the start of this experiment, you see that the blood vessels grow over the uh, material, the polymer that has the, the possible inhibitor or just no inhibitor at all, and it, and, and it goes over the material, the polymer, right to the tumor. And if you looked at an eye like this just three weeks later, it'd be three-dimensional out of the orbit of the eye. It would actually kill. But when you put the one fraction we found, when you put the, this one in, uh, what we, and we repeated this 21 times, you see the vessels on the right are sparser, they're uh, lower and they actually avoid uh, the tumor and, and polymer. So, so this showed for the first time that these molecules did exist. And, uh, but uh, it's still it, one of the things that, that I would find about medicine and one of the things that got me interested as people have mentioned earlier today in starting companies was the immense amount of time it takes from a discovery to, to really get to help patients. So this was 1976. It took another 28 years from this paper and really great work by Genetech and Napoleon Farrar and others, next slide, before the first blood vessel inhibitor would be approved by FDA. But starting 2004, something remarkable happened. One after the next, after the next angiogenesis inhibitor would get approved. Avastin is one of the top best-selling biotech drugs in history, but there are many, many others up here too for other kinds of cancers, and also for treating uh, diseases of blindness in the back of the eye. So, so drugs like ILEA and Lucentis uh, have been also very, very widely used. In fact, they're really the only pharmaceuticals that stop uh, blood vessel diseases in the back of the eye. Um, uh, so um, before this, there, there were no drugs uh, for this. Also, one of the things that has been key in a lot of these cases uh, to moving this work forward has been getting patents. I also learned that from Dr. Folkman. One day he said to me, Bob, on the, this is now on the drug delivery work, he said we should file a patent. And at this time, this was the 1970s, the Children's Hospital where I was, and, and it's a very good hospital, didn't have any patents. So we filed for a patent the first time. And next slide. Uh, actually, before we uh, do that, I was gonna say the examiner actually rejected this patent five times. And the head of the hospital and the, and the head of the tech transfer office told me that I should just give up because they're never going to allow it. And, you know, in a way he was right, but I started to think of other strategies, you know, because we tried to explain it scientifically and it never really worked. So I started to think, is there some way we could convince the patent examiner to allow this uh, patent legally, of course. And as I told you earlier, a lot of people said this was impossible. It could never work. So I, uh, uh, so I started to think, well, maybe somebody wrote that down. So I did, this was now 1982. And so I did a, a search looking back at our nature paper, which is this 1976 paper to see if anybody ever wrote anything. So I found actually quite a few things, but the next slide was particularly useful. And this was from five of the top materials people in the, the country. And what they were writing, describing this field of drug delivery is generally the agent to be released as a molecular small molecule with a molecular weight no larger than a few hundred. One would not expect that macromolecules, for example, proteins, could be released by such a technique because of their extremely small permeation rates through polymers. However, Folkman and myself have reported some surprising. Surprising is a really good word for a patent examiner that clearly demonstrate the opposite. So I showed this to the people at the hospital and they flew down to Washington 
uh, and they showed it to the examiner and the examiner said, gee, he had no idea, but he said he'd allow this patent if I could get written affidavits from each of these five people that they really wrote this. And so I wrote them as an assistant professor and they were all nice enough to write me back, they really wrote it. And we got a very broad patent, next slide. And with that, we um, licensed this to different groups. We taught different groups. And, and this is where I got involved in starting companies. In fact, first, what we did is we, I remember after 10 years, you know, it didn't seem to me like anybody cared. But finally, I got a call from a multi-billion dollar animal health company. And they said, well, we'd like to use it for animal growth hormone. And would I consult for them? And I mentioned the patent. And they said, gee, that's great. They'd like to license it. And so they gave uh, the hospital, uh, well, they gave us a grant of $200,000 and uh, they gave me a consulting fee. So I was able to get a better car. And I, um, and most exciting to me is that they were gonna use it to deliver this. The next year I got uh, the same kind of arrangement from a, a, a Eli Lilly to do insulin. And they actually did the same thing. So I was thought I, we were doing great. But the only thing that was bad was that after uh, a year or two, they weren't getting the results they wanted, so they just gave up. And then Alex Klebanoff, who was one of my colleagues, also a chemist, said, Bob, we should start our own company. So we started a little company called Enzatech, uh, which later emerged to become Alchemies. And, and, and between that and other things that we and others did, there are now many, many products on the market. And the next slide just shows some pictures of these. I won't go through them all, but they're different peptides or small molecules, ionic molecules, or other things that uh, can deliver molecules anywhere from you know days to months. Um, uh, so, and and we also thought this is now moving back to the academic lab that maybe we could, uh, you know, when we made these these particles really small. Uh, that we put different molecules, that when we made these little particles small, they didn't last very long. They're often gobbled up by macrophages. So one of the things we published in science, uh, I think in 1993 with Rexendra Greff, was that if you coated them with something like polyethylene glycol, that made the whole nanoparticle more water-like, and then the macrophages didn't eat them so fast. And, I, and again, since I was told to do a more scientific American talk, I thought I'd show you a video from Nova, the TV show, filming or making a, car, a little video of some of our work. So if we could go to the next slide. I'll try to make it work. I'm... If it doesn't, I'll, um, I'll try to narrate. I'll tell you what, it's, it's just a kind of a cute video, but if it doesn't, I can't it work. no problem. I, I, uh, so basically it's, it's just a little picture of a nanoparticle. And, and shows you that you can direct it to cells. They just explained it much better than I ever did. Uh, but our thought was that you could use this for small molecules and, and, and you could use it for genetic therapy. And in fact, what we did uh, with, uh, for genetic therapy is, uh, and, and Sagita mentioned this, I was for, uh, so, so, so we looked at different materials like polymers and we and others would look at different lipids. Dan Anderson was a postdoc in my lab at the time and we started to, doing a lot, lot of lipid work. And we actually worked with L-Nylum and L-Nylum, uh, another one of my students, Akina Kink, who was uh, uh, started there and now is a vice president, he sort of led this big effort that got on Patro approved with siRNA in it in, 19, uh, in, in 2018. And then in 2010, myself with Derek Rossi and Nubar Fay and, and Ken Chen, we started a company called Moderna. And, and people have probably heard about that, but what you may not know is the enormous criticism that Moderna got from the press and so forth. And I thought I would, we also hired, by the way, a, a great chemical engineer uh, well, for the CEO, Stefan Bonsell. So I thought I'd just show you a couple of newspaper headlines to show you just how poorly, at least a lot of people in the press thought about what we were doing. Um, next slide. Oh, this is on Patro, what I mentioned, next slide. Yeah, so this is a this is from Stat. That's a sort of a something that the Boston Globe uh, has kind of sponsored. And this guy, Damien Gard, he's somebody that writes sort of very nasty articles. And here he's just talking. This is a picture of Stefan. And here he writes, uh, e you know, about how the company's secretive, has big egos and stuff. The next slide um, talks about how it compares. Uh, uh, Moderna to uh, Theranos. The next slide actually has uh, 
me in it. This, by the way, is less than a year ago uh, from our Boston Globe, which is our, our paper, our local paper, uh, explaining how, uh, uh, with a picture of me and saying, this is not how you do science. Um, and one more slide, uh, next slide, uh, is that, uh, again, all these experts said that we didn't produce data. This is, again, May of 2020. Uh, that's critical to assessing uh, the COVID vaccine. You know, so this was very visible. I, I have to admit, it was very discouraging to see all these reports. Nonetheless, you know, I think the people at Moderna did a terrific job. And of course, next slide. It, it's in the data really, I think, was not both from Moderna and Pfizer uh, and BioNTech, all, by the way, which used nanoparticles to encapsulate the messenger RNA, really has been terrific. I mean, basically, you know, for flu, and I learned this the hard way getting it, you know, if you have a, if you get a, uh, a flu shot, you maybe get 50%, per, you know, of the time it works. Here, 95% of the time it worked, and actually pretty much 100% of the time, I, I remember the Sunday when we broke the code of the Moderna clinical trial, you know, with thousands and thousands of patients, those 30,000 patient trial, not a single person went to the hospital out of 30,000 patients. So that was actually quite striking. Um, and really it's just a tribute to the great people working there, but it's also a tribute to chemistry uh, as has been said earlier, that th this could happen. And, and to what Sangeeta said, to convergence, this was a really multidisciplinary effort, just, uh, disciplinary effort by lots of people. I thought I'd give you uh, another example of something we did. And uh, as you can see, I've been interested in materials and I, uh, that's okay, we can go, yeah. So one of the things I was curious at working at the hospital was how did materials find their way into medicine? And I, I thought naively when I started out, it must be through chemists or chemical engineers, but I found out that was rarely true. Uh, almost always what happened is that some clinician, this is in the 1970s, is some clinician would go to their house and try to find an object that kind of resembles the organ or tissue they wanted to fix. And then they'd use it on a person. And, uh, and, and, and the artificial heart's a good example. This goes back to 1967, when some of the clinicians at NIH wanted to make an artificial heart and they asked what had a good flex line and they chose a lady's girdle. And, and that's still what's used today, by the way. But one of the problems is when blood hits the surface of that artificial heart, it can form a clot and that can go to the patient's brain and they can get a stroke and die. Breast implants, one of those um, was a mattress stuffing because it was squishy. And I started thinking being a chemical engineer, well, maybe we could use a different approach rather than take things from your house. What if we ask the question, what do you really want in a biomaterial from an engineering standpoint, chemistry standpoint and biology standpoint, and then could you design it from scratch? So in the next slide, we picked an example. Uh, when we started, the only materials that were approved uh, for use were, were ones that displayed bulk erosion. Uh, they'd start looking spongy and fall apart. And that could be okay for some molecules, but for others, it could be fatal. So we said, from an engineering standpoint, what you really want is shown on the next slide, surface erosion. So how, how could you do this? How could you get that? So we started asking different chemical design questions. So first, would you want the material to design because of an enzyme, because of water or something else? And we said, well, what, we'll use water because that's a catalyst that everybody would have. And so, so then we went to, uh, the next slide just shows a schematic of monomers. And we said, well, let's make water be the catalyst. And if we do that, what we wanna do is make these monomers really hydrophobic so that, uh, so that water really has a hard time getting in. But you still want it to degrade fast enough when water gets there. So the question then is what bonds do you use? So the next slide shows pictures of, of ones that we uh, thought about and we calculated we'd wanna go up to the top to get the anhydride bond and, and therefore had the idea of synthesizing polyanhydrides. Next slide. And, and what we did is we'd pick out monomers that we thought would be safe uh, and, and non-toxic. Uh, and the next slide shows an example of that. Uh, and, and, and not only would, would what you could do is this is a copolymer and you could change the ratio of these two and then you could get different erosion rates. And the next slide just shows an example of that. 79% of the one, it's all gone in two weeks, but 0%, it'll actually last for three or four years. And this is just a millimeter thick slab. So 
Henry Brehm was a young neurosurgeon and he came to visit me in 1984, wanting to come up with a better way to treat glioblastoma multiforme. And that's uh, some data on the next slide. And it's uniformly fatal. And the only drug that people use for that is BCNU. And that's on the next slide. And what he and I thought about was that maybe what we could do is introduce this idea of local chemotherapy. Uh, and the next slide shows what we had in mind, that maybe you could lie, the neurosurgeon's gonna do the operation and line the surgical cavity with a BCNU polymer. But then it's a little wafer, but that normally just has a 12 minute lifetime. And the polymer hopefully will protect it from degradation and you get high concentrations in the brain where you want it to be and low concentrations in the rest of the body where it would cause harm. So again, when we first tried to do this, um, you know, again, we'd write grants and we did terrible. And the next slide just shows a summary of those. Uh, every, every two years, uh, we'd write one and every time people would say, well, it can't work because you can't synthesize the polymers or it will react with the drug or the polymers were fragile, they're too low molecular weight uh, or be toxic. Or each time we were able to solve some of these problems, but each time it would get rejected. In fact, the only reason we were able to get this again was because of a patent that we licensed to a company started by Sal Snyder and they gave us several million dollars to do this research. And with that, uh, we finally got FDA approval. And again, just to show you uh, some pictures, and again, if you don't like blood, don't look, but here's a little wafer going into the brain. Next slide. Usually, uh, next slide. They put seven or eight in and close up the brain. And what happens is, um, Next slide, that these are just from different publications, but it did get approved. This just shows that you can prolong life. Uh, and the next slide was studies over, over many years where they looked at 5,000 patients in roughly in 60 clinical trials and shows that it, it's not a cure by any means, but it does prolong life and relieve suffering. And basically it, uh, with that, you're able to, uh, it got FDA approved in 1996. It's still used now 25 years later in uh, over 30 countries. And it also would provide the basis for a whole other area, again, which we never could have expected, which uh, was done in part by one of my other students at the time, Elazar Edelman, and he's a cardiologist. So basically you could use the same principle, local delivery of a really an anti-cancer drug to, uh, next slide, to solve one of the biggest problems in cardiology. And that is one of the main treatments when people have heart disease today is they put in a stent. It's like a Chinese finger puzzle. And, uh, and, and basically that keeps the blood vessels open, but about 50% of the time they close off because you get uh, what's called restenosis, smooth muscle cell proliferation. And now what you can do is coat these stents with a, a material that will slowly deliver locally Taxol, an anti-cancer drug. And this prevents most of the time the restenosis. It's used on millions of patients every year, what are called drug eluting stents. So finally, I just thought I'd spend a minute or two ending by not only that you could use materials for drug delivery, but also to create new tissues or organs. And I'll just really give a quick example or two. Uh, here's a little baby on the next slide, uh, who was a patient of Jay Vacanti, who was really my main collaborator on this. And this baby would die if he didn't get a new liver. But Jay and I had this idea, next slide, that what you could do is take virtually any cell type, including stem cells. If you inject them at random, not much happens, but cells are smart. And if you put them close enough together and synthesize the right materials, the right polymers or other materials, they actually can reform structures. Actually a group at Berkeley showed you could take uh, mammary epithelial cells, put them close enough together and they can form acini and make milk. And so our idea was that we would grow them uh, in a bioreactor uh, for a period of time under the right media and conditions and make virtually any tissue or organ. And the next slide just shows a picture of a scaffold with cells on it. And I thought I'd just show you one striking example to end this talk uh, on, of what you could do and what's now is done. And this is a little baby who's two years old, who's badly burned, but you can take the product, next slide, which are neonatal fibroblasts, and you can, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, they're, they're fibroblasts, a neonatal fibroblasts, you can grow them on this, this and, and cryopreserve it, 
And now you could put them on the child uh, when he's burned, which is what's done. Next slide. This is time zero, but let's come back three weeks later. Next slide. And let's come back and I'll make this the last slide one, uh, six months later, and he's pretty much healed. And these are now, this, these are approved for patients with uh, diabetic skin ulcers and burn victims, but they're also in clinical trials for many, many other things, uh, spinal cord repair, uh, 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 blood vessel growth, uh, many other things. Sangeet has actually done great work on the liver. And not only can you do this, you can also use these approaches to create organs and tissues on a chip. And, and so people are studying this. Uh, people from our lab did work on making a heart on a chip, a GI tract on a chip. I mentioned Sangeeta and also Linda Griffith have done uh, livers on a chip, but pretty much everything is being on a chip, which may someday uh, reduce the amount of animal testing and human testing. So I'm gonna stop there and I just wanna say really again, what a tremendous honor this is for me, both to be in a, with a group of people, associated with a group of people like this. And I wanna thank Matt and the Dreyfus Foundation and all of you for, for giving me this. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> and congratulations to you. As a person who's walking around with two shots of Moderna, I'm very grateful <laughs> on a personal well, level. Well, thank you. Now, Bob, I, I, I'm going to let Matt have some final words. Thank you. Uh, unless there are some questions, we don't have any in the chat, but if anybody would like to speak up, uh, we can take a minute or two. Okay, Bob, I think we'll, we'll wrap it up. Um, I, on behalf of the foundation, I, I would like to say how proud we are to uh, have your name associated with the Dreyfus uh, Prize in the chemical sciences. Um, it's a very uh, intense process that we go through um, and uh, your name came uh, to the top very quickly. And you know, you can tell from today the kind of uh, admiration there is for you and the kind of influence that you've had. And uh, uh, that should be very satisfying. And I, I think all of us associated with the foundation are proud to be associated with the uh, award of the Dreyfus Prize in the Chemical Sciences uh, for Chemistry in Support of Human Health uh, going to you, Bob. So congratulations. Thank you to all of our audience and um, as I said, we're in the process of picking the next prize winner in environmental sciences. I'd, I'd like to acknowledge, too, uh, we have at least one past prize winner here, Chris Matyashevsky. So thank you, Chris, for, for joining us the, this afternoon. And uh, if there's another one, I, I can't see everybody, but uh, it's been a great audience and it's been fun to be here the, the whole afternoon. There's Chris. So <laughs> thanks. Congratulations, Bob. <laughs> Thank you for sending off all these postdocs, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I think that draws an end to our festivities for today. Thanks to all the speakers and the moderators and everybody, and uh, most of all to Bob. So thank, thank you all. Thanks very, very much. Okay. Bye, everybody.